leaders, you know, you can't be, you know, standing up there with drooping shoulders, right? You have to be the positive leader. You have to bring in energy in your teams, in your conversations, because that's how you will lift the overall energy of the organization. And Gen Z, therefore, will run, you know, things on their own terms. And I'm already seeing that, right? They're very clear, clarity of thought, very clear in terms of what they want to do and how they want to do. So it will be running things on in their own terms. If the question is, have you failed? I failed a number of times, right? And I think failing is very important. We are back. Yet another episode, yet another guest. This is Inspire Someone Today, your platform for amplifying inspiration. We all, over the last few months, have heard about terminologies like the Great Resignation, it's raining jobs, it's bleeding attrition, hybrid work, and much more. We have someone who is at the center of all of this and much more. Joining me is the CHRO of PepsiCo India, and who, according to the ex-CEO of PepsiCo, Mr. Shiv Shiv Kumar, said this. She is one of the brighter lights of the HR fraternity in this decade. I don't think I need to make any more introduction for our wonderful guest joining us today, Pavitra Singh. It's an absolute joy to have you on Inspire Someone today. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Shikan, for having me. Really excited and looking forward to it. Great. I think growing up, a lot of the folks uh, like me were used to this term called as a dil mange more, which literally means this heart needs more. And extension of that, Pavitra, is something that you do very well, which is lead from the heart. So why don't you tell us about what is this dil mange more in your parlance? And what does it mean in the current context? Yeah, no, thank you, uh, Shrikant. And I think very aptly put, I mean, uh, you know, this is something that I truly believe and I'm very passionate about, right? So let me elaborate when I say lead with a heart, what does it really mean, right? I've just coined it, um, you know, for one of the articles. And I think it stayed with me because it's something that I truly believe in, right? So heart really is humility, empathy, agility, reflective and transformational. And you know what, when you look at the last two years, um, of COVID pandemic, you know, while COVID pandemic continues, we've seen so many other challenges, right? Whether it's commodity, whether it's now the Ukraine war impacting the supply chain, you, we've seen so many challenges. But I think what's really remained and what I've truly believed is that, you know, if you lead with a heart, right? And if you take care of some of these, you know, smaller things and basic things like, you know, being humble and being open to listening, right? I mean, what I have observed during you know, pandemic, we, none of us had any answers. You know, you, we've heard enough and more that there was no leadership. There was no playbook for this kind of a leadership, right? Nothing existed. You had to kind of think through and act on the go, right? Because every time there was a new problem or a new situation, uh, you know, that came in front of you. And that's when I think leaders need to be really grounded, be open to ideas, listen, you know. And when you're listening, listening with empathy, because I think what COVID taught all of us is, you know, bringing that empathy to the forefront. You know, one of the biggest leadership traits, I think, will now, which has, which is always there, but COVID has brought it to the forefront and I think should continue to stay. It's really about empathy, right? Really understanding, seeing it from an employee's perspective, viewpoint. Uh, Agility, we've seen, again, you know, with COVID, uh, the kind of agility that our teams have demonstrated in terms of just looking at the business situation, unlocking, figuring out how to do things. I think has is something that again uh, we we rediscovered and uh, needs to continue to exist. And I think agility is one of the name of the games there. Yeah? And then of course you know it's also allowed us to kind of reflect. Okay, through COVID, I think you know we've been able to kind of you know take a pause, take a step back, and say, hey, you know what do we need to do differently? How do I need to approach this problem? So I think reflection is something. Uh, we've always said that you know any of the training programs, uh, learning programs, we've always focused on you know reflection. But I think COVID truly made us pause and reflect, right? And of course, last is, you know, it also gave us an opportunity to really change the game. Think of doing things differently, transforming the way we look at, you know, do business, you know, right from business to our HR processes, keeping employees, consumers, customers at the heart of everything that we do. So I think that's really for me leading with the heart. You know, it embodies a lot of, I think, um, what I've been able to learn in the last two years, something that I have practiced, and I think it's going to be the name of the game going forward as well. 
and this is something that you definitely don't get to see in the four walls of the academia this is more something that you learn on the go in the live experiment that you, we are all encountering in our workplaces absolutely i mean nobody teaches you all this right you have to experience it and you have to learn you know from all these experiences and grow and pavit if i were to ask you what has been your own leadership learnings coming out of the pandemic what has the pandemic made you to change or made you to do things differently see look everybody's leadership uh, you know including mine has evolved and will continue to evolve uh, i don't think anyone expected this level of uncertainty and for that long and that has made all of us i think taught leaders and taught me to be patient and resilient and to relook at things especially i would say from an employee perspective one such example i'll just bring you know uh, here is really the hybrid workplace as an example right everybody's talking about and you mentioned everybody's talking about the hybrid workplace now leaders need to redefine their view of how work is done and delivered so i think the whole definition of um, what is work right and where will that work you know deliver uh, get delivered you know what is the role of the office okay i think is completely getting redefined okay so i think you know i have evolved therefore uh, to that extent that you know how do you kind of now take a pause reflect and look at things differently okay i also think uh, you know uh, communication and empathy have got redefined in, in terms of what employees expect of leaders uh, and we've seen that in the pandemic okay the kind of communication we've had to do uh, one is of course communication to many and therefore upping the communication through town halls but it's also about communication you know on a one on one basis really again trying to understand and getting the pulse in different ways you know gone were the days where you would travel and you would get to know what's really happening now everyone had to depend on a virtual mode right and therefore very quickly kind of redefining the way you work and saying okay if i need to really understand the pulse how do i do it how do i amp my communication and start spreading my wings in different ways remotely virtually but different cohorts right and talking to them and understanding what the pulse is so communication got redefined right and how you were communicating with that kind of transparency with hope with positivity empathy has spoken about right i think uh, you know i personally i i've learned a lot and i think you know while empathy always was a part of uh, my leadership characteristic but i think it came to the forefront even more uh so i think that and thirdly i would say you know bringing energy okay as leaders and that's been a big learning for me that as leaders you know you can't be you know standing up there with drooping shoulders right you have to be the positive leader you have to bring in energy in your teams in your conversations because that's how you will lift the overall energy of the organization so i think that's you know today if i look at leadership as i said evolved i have personally evolved okay a lot of patience a lot of resilience uh, empathy coming to the forefront and uh, different ways of communicating and reaching out to people uh, transparency and uh, yeah and of course most important you know bringing in energy you know into the organization rightly said energy flows from the top and you need to kind of demonstrate that particular piece uh, fair and square absolutely and pavit in lot many ways some of the practices that pepsico had was ahead of its time before the pandemic hit us one example is location free roles that you guys had i'm sure that would have come in handy during the pandemic times and similar to that the changing face of the work environment today you mentioned about hybrid work we're also talking about a big chunk of our workforce have not even seen the office location but there are uh, colleagues yeah right the other piece of it is the whole gen x uh, millennials out there in the workforce and you being w- one of the moms of the gen z uh, generation <laughs> yeah if you can unpack some of these things what does it mean the location free uh, experiment working with a hybrid model working with the millennials gen z what are some of the thoughts insights that uh, you have kind of absorbed to all of this sure so you know pepsico has been a pioneer in location free roles right for close to a decade you know i myself actually benefited from these location free roles so twice in my career i've actually done location free roles which really means that the role is possibly docked at some other location so i did the global campus role which was based out of our headquarter in purchase new york out of uh, you know gurgaon the second time around you know i i was leading the talent acquisition for sector which was spanning from anz to you know china to saudi egypt india and i was doing that role out of uh, india again right so i've really benefited many other colleagues of mine have also benefited with these location free roles so it's not a novel concept i think we've experimented and you know feel really proud that we were really pioneers in this um, 
in this initiative. So uh, it has worked wonderfully, uh, I think, uh, for the organization and for talent. I think the first thing that PepsiCo has recognized that, uh, you know, it is about trusting employees, you know, and if you trust employees, they are able to give their best. And location free is one example. You don't need to be right there, you know, in front of your manager or your teams, right? I think that trust factor is very important. And I think that's what uh, has been a big realization. We've also been able to kind of, you know, uh, retain uh, talent and nurture talent, right? This location tree has given that opportunity, you know, so we've been able to give differentiated experiences to our talent while making sure that, you know, people are growing and are, are retaining their foot in the organization. It's also given some of our high potentials, the flexibility needed to manage their careers in times when they really needed that support, right? And especially women, okay? And I wouldn't say it's a gender thing. I mean, today it's men and women both have needs. You know, it could be a man who wants to be with his ailing parents and therefore can't move or a female who has a small child and therefore is not willing to move. Uh, move. So it has really provided that flexibility. And, you know, so nobody's compromising in terms of growth, right? People are seeing that growth through location fee roles. So I think it's really been a win-win uh, concept for all of us. The only thing I would say is that, you know, we've evolved because when I did the location fee roles, technology was not so savvy. It used to be the world of Skype and therefore it wasn't the same as it is today. I think with COVID, one of the, you know, silver linings of, uh, you know, and, and enablers of location free is it's become so seamless, you know, so you're able to kind of connect and, you know, see each other so well. And it's like as you're, you know, speaking to somebody just across the table. So I think digitally uh, uh, things are much better today. So I would say uh, that's really what it is. And, uh, you know, from a digital perspective also, I think the other piece that oh, we were really, uh, what really helped us when COVID hit us was we had gone completely digital in terms of all our HR processes, you know, so whether it was hiring, right, our entire talent acquisition team has been digital. So all our interviews, everything, you know, was done digitally. So when COVID hit us, it was a very natural step for us. You know, it was seamless. You know, we didn't need to kind of grapple with the fact that, oh, okay, how do we do this now, right? So I think we had the systems, technologies, you know, our ways of working was were already tweaked, right? Uh, imagine when I was in talent acquisition, we ran a whole uh, campus competition across 25 uh, campuses completely digitally. So I think, uh, you know, that proactiveness in terms of thinking digital first really helped us, you know, during the pandemic. Your second question on uh, Gen Z, uh, that's an interesting one, uh, Shrikant, because, uh, you know, as you said, yes, I am a Gen Z mom. I've got a daughter, uh, Niharika, who is 14 plus, so will turn 15. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, really, when I look at her, I, I often reflect and say that the skills that are needed are very, very different for my daughter. As I look at my daughter, and I see that, look, what this set of population or this cohort is going to the table is going to bring to the table is going to be very different and i'll just draw parallels right uh, when i look at her you know while she's great at studies but she wants to do other things right she wants to enroll in hip-hop she wants to do uh, kathak she wants to do many other things she's already do doing for a social impact ngo she's doing she's kind of helping them out right with the social media communication right so if you look at it her outlook is about is already global when i was growing up you know, my boundaries were defined in terms of where I grew up, really India. It wasn't, it wasn't ever global, right? But my daughter has her own definition of both, you know, from both her talent as well as her opportunities, right? And Gen Z, therefore, will run, you know, things on their own terms. And I'm already seeing that, right? They're very clear, clarity of thought, very clear in terms of what they want to do and how they want to do. So it will be running things on in their own terms. Secondly, I think, and, and this is something we need to accept. There is no choice. I think we have to accept that this generation comes with a very different set of terms, the very different ways of working, right? So I think we need to acknowledge and accept that, okay? There are a few things that I'm already seeing very, very, which are very important to this uh, generation. For example, climate change. Very, very passionate about climate change, okay? And they're already talking about that. They want to join organizations which have that purpose, that are talking sustainability, right? That are not just talking, but are delivering on sustainability promises. Okay. So I think that's something that is purpose and, you know, what you're, how you're giving back to society and the environment is very important. The other piece is inclusion. Uh, you know, if you look at the whole LGBTQI plus journey, right? We've embarked on this very recently. But, uh, when I was talking to my daughter, you know, she uh, literally said, she looked at me and she said, look, you're ancient, you know, because, uh, you know, uh, we're already living that, right? And, and therefore the kind of, you know, inclusion that, uh, that we are seeing is of a very different order, right? Again, I think that's something that they're very passionate about, very passionate about equality. So I think with some of these, 
trends and themes that we're seeing, uh, organizations like us will need to change. You know, we'll need to kind of be open to this kind of a thinking, this kind of thoughts uh, and embrace that. So because there is absolutely merit in, in what they're bringing to the table in, in terms of how they're thinking. So, yeah, it's going to be different, but I think uh, we need to definitely, it's going to be a great positive change and we need to welcome that. You bet. And again, if you were to have a crystal ball gazing at all of these things, you have a multi-generational workforce, you are in a hybrid model, it's a digital native kind of a setup. But with all of these things loaded, what are the things that you would call upon line managers, leaders to watch out to make things amiable, to make things like you said, uh, what works with this particular generation is the sense of purpose. What works with ge- with this generation is a larger than bigger objective apart from revenues and matrices. So given this kind of a backdrop, what would be your uh, words of wisdom for line managers, for leaders? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, uh, line managers need to be open. Okay, as I said, see, there is merit in your multi-generational workforce coming together. Right. Because there is every cohort, every generation has something to give. Okay. Which is absolutely valuable. Uh, and therefore, the way I see it is that, you know, and I see that, you know, when I, I see my management trainees, youngsters coming from campus interacting with, you know, aligned managers who are possibly very seasoned. But there is something there is, there is a great opportunity to learn both ways. Right. The management trainees, mm-hmm. the younger force bring in a very different perspective and the, you know, the line managers. Who have absolutely seasoned, bringing a very different perspective. So I see there's a, it's a fantastic melting pot. That's what diversity and inclusion is all about. That there is merit in diversity as long as you're able to make that inclusion work. And therefore, my recommendation would be that, you know, we need to be open. Okay. We can't be now one of the days where we are looking at, okay, this my way or highway, right? Uh, there will be people who will challenge the status quo. I think that openness and that willingness is going to be very important. Again, going back to, you know, Taking a pause, reflecting, and being open to some of the transformational ideas, okay, is going to be very important. So that would be my, uh, you know, input for the line managers because, uh, you know, we are going to be seeing this, right? And I, and the funny thing is, you know, when you look at, um, we, you know, we're talking about the digital world and the entire piece, right? I think one of the pieces that I see is possibly, you know, where the, where the Gen Zs can really learn is the last mile execution. I've seen that happen um, with the management trainees coming, to, especially the new uh, campus folks coming into the workforce, okay? I think the kind of sense of last mile execution that our line managers are able to demonstrate, okay, because of the kind of work experience, I'm seeing that great drop of effect in our, uh, you know, campus students and the younger your, your workforce that's coming to the table, you know, understanding what that really means because, you know, You've not done that yourself and therefore that hardcore learning that you get from these leaders is phenomenal. So I think there's a lot of learning at the lots of examples uh, that, uh, you know, I can give, but lots of lots of learnings that uh, both the generations can uh, get from each other. While we have been discussing the new face of work, what does it take to succeed in this uh, ever-changing work environment? I'm sure the listeners out there would be wondering, what's Pavitra's journey all about? How did she end up doing what she's doing today and what are some of the influences that she had had along her journey <laughs> okay so um lots of influences in my life frankly because i i uh, truly believe that you know you learn different things and you pick up different things from different leaders okay so right from the beginning the leaders that i've worked with i've picked up something from somebody so you know there are multiple role models multiple folks who've influenced my career journey and each of the leaders, I think one of the unique things that they've done for me is they've pushed me in different ways, pushed me such that I'm able to kind of really figure out and discover and rediscover myself or okay, can challenge myself. Uh, so I think I've been honestly a very, I'm lots of gratitude, very thankful, and I've been blessed to get uh, leaders uh, who've really helped me grow in my journey. But I think as an individual, uh, Shrikant, you know, I personally believe and I, I think that's important for every individual to be secure. Uh, I believe I'm a very secure person because I've always believed in running my own race. You know, there's no competition with someone else. And I think uh, that's something that I always tell, especially to my to my women colleagues, right? Or, you know, who always come back and say, okay, listen, I, 
I had a child, I had to take a break. I, I had to take a sabbatical and therefore I'm going to lose out, right? Somebody else is moving ahead in that journey. And I always tell them that, listen, have the confidence, okay? And have the belief in yourself. You are running your own race. Don't look at the others. You know, everybody's race and everybody's path is very different. Your path is different, you know, and you decide. You know, there will be different crossroads, which will be very different, which may, will be unique to you. You have to make those choices along that, along the lane, you know, and, and the path that you've chosen. And, and therefore, there will be, it's your choice. So don't look outside. Don't look at the other lane. Just focus in your lane, right? And trust me, everything will just, will be fine. It will just work out. Okay. So I think that's something that I have believed in that has really helped me, right? I, I have myself taken a break. I have taken a sabbatical. I have done part-time roles, right? So I have made those, you know, made those choices along the way. But that's fine because, you know, you need to make some of those choices at, at any point in time and you need to be comfortable making those choices. Don't feel guilty and don't look back, look ahead. So I think that's really helped me. And I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, that's what I would recommend and I would, you know, advise the others. Uh, but the other thing that's very, very important for me is really values. I mean, I'm a very, very values driven uh, person. I think I would uh, give credit to my upbringing, my parents, my teachers, you know, in a, in a convent uh, school. And I think those values that have got instilled, uh, you know, have stayed with me because every decision that I take or if there's any dilemma that I have, you know, it's, it's very clear. There's no gray, right? I mean, if your values are strong, there's no gray, right? It's either, you know, black or white, right? So I think that has really helped me till date. It helps me. You know, when I'm in tough situations and tough uh, spots to kind of make those decisions, right? So I think that's really uh, helped me. And, uh, you know, for me, again, in all this, I want to find a balance, you know, between the company and therefore their time spent, you know, what's good for the company and therefore company policy and what is the employee need. And I try to kind of balance and figure out what is the right thing to do without possibly bending rules. That has worked for me, right? Because if you are, again, values driven and you believe in the right thing, then again, those decisions are very easy to make. Uh, what is equally important for me is my family and personally believe that uh, you live to work and not work to live, right? And that harmony is very important. So, uh, yes, that's what's kind of helped me navigate my journey, Shrikant. Now, those are some wonderful nuggets, Pavitra. I, I think adding to that, if I were to ask you one additional piece, because the notion always is when you look at folks like you and the title CHRO PepsiCo India, the fundamental assumption is that it's been one straight lane of uh, success after success, victory after victory. But I'm sure you had had your days where you said this is not what it is. I think our listeners would love to hear what was the failure point? What was those points saying that this is not something I would want to do? Did it ever happen in the first place? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, if the question is, have you failed? I failed a number of times, right? And I think failing is very important because if you don't fail, you will never grow. You will never know what is good or what you what you want or what is best or, you know, or what is great, right? You will never know. So I think it's extremely important, you know, to kind of try, experiment, fail, but rise up very quickly, right? You know, learn from it and move on. So I think I have seen many failures and and in the, in the process, I think it's also very important to have the right people around you, the right environment around you that, in, that can enable this, right? Uh, I remember when I just joined PepsiCo and I was trying to do something, um, you know, which was out of the box and ahead of its time. And uh, my boss told me that, look, this is not going to work because uh, the organization is not very digitally savvy yet. But uh, because I was so passionate and I really believed in it, I said, no, I, I really believed in it. And I said, no, I want to do it. And he said, okay, go for it. If you believe in it so much, go for it, right? And six months down the line, guess what? I failed, right? And I was just new in the organization. I was just barely, you know, six, seven months in the organization, right? But the fact that, you know, A, I was passionate and I, I really believed in it. I was allowed to take that risk. Okay. And I had my boss backing me up. And once I failed, that failure was celebrated because that thinking was ahead of the curve. Yes, it didn't work, uh, you know, at that time, but it was something that, you know, it, it put a seed for something in the future. So it was back. That failure was really back until date. Therefore, you know, I have taken that risk number of times because I truly believe that yes, the organization will back. So I think it's very important to have that kind of an environment that will also help you. And, you know, it's okay to fail. And in, in fact, very interestingly, we are going to be celebrating uh, another failure in the town hall. And I wouldn't say it's a failure, but I think it's about, you know, you've dared to challenge the status, right? May, may not have been successful. Doesn't matter, right? Let's celebrate that and let's learn from it and let's move on. 
so i think that's that's very important as a concept you know and uh, we need to live that <laughs> as parents as professionals both so here we are to start off the part of three round the first of the questions in the part of three round pavitra what are your three success mantras okay the first i would say is uh, you know i'm an extremely a uh, passionate person very grounded because uh, with uh, being grounded humility is something that makes you also humble as well as vulnerable and the third i would say is honesty in what you do the right the intent is very important so if you have the right intent everything flows through great three routines that are uniquely yours so yeah i i love my yoga practice in the morning i think that helps me uh, de stress a second i do love spending time with my daughters we often are binging on netflix together okay and uh, that just helps me to bond and uh, the third thing is that i just love um, you know traveling and meeting people so whether it's my work i'm often seen in plants or units or you know personally i love just traveling the world and you know experimenting i, I think you have a sneak insight into my next question which is three places on your bucket list okay <laughs> Well yes I would uh, love to do a uh, latam you know the entire latin america uh, I would uh, love to go to japan and uh, australia so these three These are from a travel standpoint anything else on your bucket list three things on your bucket list outside of travel You know one is of course as I said travel the world definitely second uh, you know give back to society I'm especially very passionate about women and uh, girl children So that's something that I would definitely at some point in time I will do something in that space. And uh, the third thing is of course I spend more time uh, maybe after a few years let's see what the uh, what things hold for me but really take my parents around with me uh, and see the world right so I think these are the three things. Wow how nice. Three skills all aspiring leaders can get better at. I think uh, the first would be resilience. Okay, I think that's the name of the game, and therefore, uh, you know, we will need to get resilient with lots of curveballs coming our way, and will continue to come. Uh, the second, uh, I will still say empathy. It's just not a phase of COVID, but I think that's something that needs to be a part of our DNA and the way we work. Okay, and the third thing would be I, I spoke about energy and you know bringing in that whole positivity. So as leaders, you know, how do you be? that change catalyst evangelist right whether it's about showing hope whether it's about bringing in energy and positivity in the organization i would say being that catalyst to 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 that change great okay the last of the part of three round here it is three individuals you would like to have breakfast with <laughs> obama okay for mm-hmm. sure right I think the second would be yeah I think Elon Musk interesting I'd like to see what he has to offer definitely and uh, the third um, back into the past maybe Indira Gandhi nice list so you want to have breakfast with Elon Musk of uh, Tesla or Elon Musk of Twitter <laughs> okay by the time I do have breakfast it'll be plus plus many more <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful Pavitra those are the power of three questions thank you for being a sport So I think no conversation is complete without having a conversation about culture and transformation with Pavitra In the changing world how important is this particular element of culture transformation and what is that again I go back to the same question what is that leaders line managers should do in order to make culture what it is and enhance it because working world is changing on a daily basis look i think uh, cultural transformation requires a very different um, order of uh, ownership now as an organization grows it will be agile if everyone is working in the organization has the sense of um, owners mentality i i don't know if you've read this book uh, you know by chris sook okay of bain who wrote about this owner's mindset right which is about um, taking responsibility for the outcomes and being empowered to make the decisions that will help achieve these results right so when every person in the organization in the company starts thinking and ha- starts having this own, you know owner's mindset it will start looking at things very differently whether it's about you know the kind of cost that you're incurring you know what are what kind of spends you know if you were at home you would think of your cost very differently are you really thinking of the same way you know in the organization context right 
So I think one of the biggest thing when we talk about cultural transformation is really about developing this whole, you know, owner's mindset, right? That do I really think company first, team second and individual next, right? The moment you have and shift that mindset and that lens, culture that you start developing is very different. And we started this journey and I'll give you an example, right? Uh, I, I spoke about owner's mindset and stemming from empowerment, okay? We started this journey a few years ago where we said, okay, I think it's really important to empower our people. You know, we trust them. Let's empower them because we know that they are doing the best that they can. They are doing what they can for the organization, right? So empowerment comes first. The second is, of course, you know, making sure that we're pegging the right accountability. Okay, that yes, you're empowered, but you know, empowerment comes with that accountability. So you are accountable for those results. And we started this journey in a very, you know, simple way. We said, let's look at three things, okay? Let's start off with, you know, looking at processes, for example. Where are the decisions, uh, you know, taking place today? And therefore, you know, what decisions, you know, do I need to shift to the front line or to the field or where I want the decisions to be made? And we realized that, look, you know, so many decisions were being taken by the headquarter, right? So while you're saying your teams are empowered, but guess what? If you look at the SOA, if you look at the dice matrix, you know, decisions are being done by the headquarter and the headquarter possibly has no idea what's happening in the front line. Okay, or because they are not close to the market. So I think that was the first thing that we did as you were looking at this transformation, that for empowerment, let's redesign the SOAs. Let's look at the dice matrix, okay? And let's shift the power of gravity from the headquarter to the front line, to the field. The second thing that we really did was we said, okay, let's look at also uh, uh, the structure and see how can we simplify the structure, okay? How can we de-layer to help bring about more agility in decision-making? And the third, we said, you know, yes, while processes, while, you know, structure is there, but we also need to start building that capability. And when I say capability, it's a mindset because you can have all that. But if you don't have that right mindset, you will not be able to achieve the desired results. So we started working a lot in terms of the mindset and building capability. We call it the GM mindset. We said, think like a general manager, irrespective of whichever location unit that you're operating in. You are the CEO, you are the GM for that particular location. So think like that. Don't think that you are a supply chain function or you're a sales function, right? You are a GM and therefore start thinking end to end. The moment we started building this capability and this mindset, we started seeing fantastic results, right? Because now, you know, we had people in the field, in the plant, in the, in the sales units coming back with, you know, with challenges and unlocks. And those unlocks were not necessarily from their function. It was taking a step back, reflecting and saying, hey, if I were to look at the end to end supply chain, or the value chain, I can find unlocks here and there. So you started seeing that mindset coming into play, that really that owner's mindset. You know, if you're the owner of a company, you will think end to end, right? So that's what we kind of, you know, started working on. And, you know, that really helped us as we were looking at uh, our cultural transformation. The second is enlisting people and getting the top 80, you know, the next layer, the top 80, getting them to be a part of this change, right? Because while, yes, the tone, and the direction is set by the leadership, the next layer plays a very important role because they're leading the masses. So very important to kind of um, bring the middle management into the vision that you've set out, you know, in terms of the change that you want to see. And that helped us because if you don't enlist them, if they don't own that vision together, right, you can talk about uh, it in different ways, but if they don't own it and if they don't cascade it to the front line, you know, you've missed the bus there. So I think that really helped us to engage the top 80, bring them, let have them own parts of the vision or parts of those change, and then take it forward and cascade it to the last mile, right? We leverage storytelling as a very important tool because I truly believe that, you know, stories have a power to kind of convey, you know, the message in the right way and in a way that sticks to people. So we leveraged a lot of storytelling to kind of communicate the kind of change, the kind of mindset that we were trying to drive. We've got also a fantastic set of behaviors, which we call the PepsiCo way. So, you know, that sits at the base of everything, you know, and we've got fantastic tenets, like one of the tenets talks about act as owners. So we started dialing up some of those behaviors through storytelling, some of the success stories that we've already seen in different parts of uh, India, you know, stories coming from the plant, from the sales, uh, from headquarters, and started talking about it. So I think that really helped to create a multiplier impact. Uh, we started seeing that change, you know, and change, a lot of that change sometimes, you know, yes, tangible results. But a lot of intangible stuff as well, right? Because that's why they say culture is what, you know, is the smell of the place, the feel of the place, right? And you can start seeing that change, you know, 
in in terms of uh, how people are reacting and responding to each other, the kind of collaboration, the intent, you know, that, hey, this is right for PepsiCo. Let's do this. Constructive conflicts. Right? Conflict is good because we want people to challenge the status quo. So I think a lot of that we've been able to kind of see, feel, smell, right? And uh, that gives us a confidence that we are on the right, right, right track. It looks like you gave us a f- playbook for making cultural transformation. I-, I thoroughly agree with everything that you stated. There's a sense of pride when you empower people and give them the accountability to go out there and achieve success, just not for themselves, but collectively for the organization and for the team. I have seen this in close quarters. Yeah. It very well resonates to what you very neatly articulated. I think one piece that I really kind of take away from this of everything that you stated is the power of storytelling. I think you can do everything, but if you cannot articulate what you have done through stories that can stick, then it, it will not fly long. Absolutely. And, you know, you can get, encourage uh, different behaviors like risk taking uh, through stories again, that be bold, take risk. And here is what and you can start rewarding and start changing that tone through powerful storytelling. So, yeah. Firm believer in that, Srikant. <laughs> Wonderful. Pavitra, it's been fantastic having you with us, getting from you all of these wonderful nuggets. This show is all about creating ripples of inspiration. So before we sign off, if our listeners would want to hear Pavitra's Inspire Someone Today message, what's that message going to be like? Yeah, look, I feel, you know, you never know who you inspire. And even if you are able to inspire through that one thought, one nugget, just imagine the kind of ripple impact you're going to create because that one thought can, you know, change different lives or can change a different thought or behavior. And uh, that can be a multiplier. So that's my advice uh, to everyone that, you know, keep inspiring. I think we all have um, so much to give to each other and so much to learn from each other. And platforms like these, uh, Shrikant, really help uh, to do exactly this. So continue to be the multiplier. Thank you, Pavitra. Appreciate all of your thoughts. Keep inspiring. That's our line as well. So we couldn't have had a wonderful, better guest than you. Thank you so much for sharing your uh, thoughts, ideas, experiences, and above all, the good word that we can all be multipliers to create a positive uh, ripple change in our communities. Thank you for listening into today's edition of Inspire Someone Today. It's been a privilege to bring in these conversations. If you like this episode and have any feedback or comments, do mail me at inspire someone today podcast at the rate gmail.com. Inspiring someone is like creating ripples around us. If you like what to listen, feel free to share them and let's create ripples of inspiration. Do not forget to follow me on my Instagram handle at the rate inspire someone today podcast for all the latest updates. This is Srikant, your host, signing off and until next time, keep inspiring.